Good afternoon and welcome to the Partnerships for Environmental Public Health webinar titled Communication Research. My name is Liam O'Fallon and I coordinate the Partnerships for Environmental Public Health program at the National Institute of Environmental Health Sciences, Division of Extramural Research and Training. I will be the moderator for today's session. As the NIEHS continues to implement its strategic plan, one of the central goals is communication and engagement. Through the Partnerships for Environmental Public Health, we have been emphasizing the critical importance of communication research. Today's 90-minute webinar advances our consideration of this topic and brings in new voices to the conversation. In the first presentation, Dr. Gary Kreps of George Mason University will discuss several key strategies for conducting meaningful evaluation research for guiding the development, implementation, refinement, and institutionalization of effective health communications programs. Then Dr. Matthew Kruder of Washington University in St. Louis will highlight an online tool that helps users create their own versions of evidence-based health communication materials for the specific populations they serve. To close out the webinar, Dr. Brian Zygmunt Fisher of the University of Michigan will discuss strategies to support meaningful understanding of environmental exposure risk. It is my pleasure to introduce our distinguished presenters for today. Dr. Krebs is a university distinguished professor and director for the Center for Health and Risk Communication at George Mason University. He studies the role of communication in enhancing health promotion, risk prevention, health advocacy, and quality of care. He is a fellow of the American Academy of Health Behavior and has received many scholarly awards. He serves as scientific advisor to domestic and international health agencies, foundations, and corporations. And before joining the faculty at George Mason, he was chief of the health communication and informatics research branch at the National Cancer Institute. Dr. Krebs, the floor is yours. Thank you very much for that kind introduction. Um, I'm really glad to be here to talk to you today about uh, developing and refining health communication programs uh, for communicating with diverse audiences. It's becoming increasingly important to use communication as a key part of healthcare and health promotion. Um, we use uh, communication in a number of different ways. Uh, print media is uh, probably the oldest and most standard use of communication, such as posters, pamphlets, handouts, magazines, newspapers, and journals. Um, personal interactions are a powerful and dynamic form of communication, face-to-face uh, -face and interviews and counseling, education, support groups. Uh, entertainment media are a really powerful and uh, influential form of communication that's very dramatic and memorable. Um, and then digital media has really made a huge difference in the world of communication, uh, providing a pervasive and ubiquitous access to information um, in a variety of different uh, places. It's actually really caused an information revolution where consumers have access to information. The problem is, is that it's difficult to control all these different forms of communication to get them to work uh, together in a complementary fashion and to make sure that the information that you're providing is having the influence that you want it to have and because of that, I, I'm going to talk today about the use of evaluation research because we want to know uh, what impact, what influences are our health communications programs having? Are they really working? What influences do they have? Is anybody paying attention to these programs? How do diverse audiences respond to these programs? What is being learned from these programs? Are there any unintended effects? Uh, such as boom boomerang effects that often can have negative influences on your audiences. And why do some health communication programs work and what parts of them seem to work the best? With that information, you can make good choices about the best use of communication. Well, to, to start with, you need to figure out what, you, what are your goals? What are you trying to do? What, what are the health communication programs intended to accomplish? What do you want to get out of your programs? Um, what audiences do you want to reach? Uh, recognizing that different audiences will demand different types of messages, uh, different channels, different sources of information. 
So once you can identify what you want to accomplish and who you want to attract with your information, you can strategically design your communication to match those needs. What do you want those audience members to do? And can they do them? What resources do they need to do what you want them to do? Uh, do you have measurable goals and outcomes that you want to accomplish with your research? Uh, you need to think about that up front because if you want to evaluate your work, you want to make sure what it is that you want to accomplish. Is there an established baseline that's already out there for, for what people are currently doing? And, and, and so you can demonstrate if you're moving them from that baseline. Is there a strategy for making your programs effective? And that strategy should be uh, based on some uh, prior evidence and theory uh, that will guide you in making decisions about what you want to do. Are, are programs that you're designing sensitive to unique audiences, including the cultures, needs, literacy levels, and expectations of those groups? And I know that later on that Matt will be talking about some strategies for making your programs more sensitive to unique audiences. Now, many programs are designed with very good intentions. We want to accomplish goals. We want to influence people. We want to promote health. But because of limited access to data, uh, there's, a, there's often many mistakes. And then a lot of those mistakes are based on a number of erroneous logics. And I want to just kind of debunk them for you. Um, the first one is that if you just build it, uh, people will come. If you just do it, if you just communicate, just do it, like Nike says, is one of those strategies. Uh, but the truth of the matter is, just doing it is not enough. You've got to do it in a very strategic way. Um, there's a rush to action in a lot of health promotion. Just go out and do it. Let's not do too much planning. Let's get it out there. We're in a hurry. And the problem is, is if you're hurrying to get things done, uh, you may be doing it in a way that is not very effective and you're wasting your resources and your time and your energy. Uh, this is the way it's always been done around here. We don't need to do it differently. It's always worked in the past. Well, the way things may have worked in the past are not likely to work in the future. We're in a very changing and volatile information environment. Uh, the health system is changing. The audiences are changing. Um, we need to try and adapt our communication to meet these new demands. I like the pro program just the way it is. It works for me. I don't need to change it. Uh, people don't want to. It's the old notion of it ain't broke, don't fix it. But the problem is you always need to refine and improve communication. It can't stay the same. Evaluating research is not in our budget. And this is a big one, especially now in times of fiscal constraint, uh, that oftentimes people say, you know, I would love to do evaluation research. We just don't have the money for it. Uh, so we, we're going we're gonna to skip it. But, but skipping evaluation is a, is a foolish thing to do because it ends up wasting your money and it, make, and it limits the effectiveness of your programs. Uh, Data gathering is too time consuming. Um, and while that's true, it is time consuming, it is time well spent. And I'm going to talk about some strategies for building it into your communication efforts so it's not as time consuming. And I think planning ahead, uh, designing evaluation into your, into your programs uh, will make it less time consuming. Uh, data are hard to understand and implement. And this is partly a problem of people who are not particularly well trained at conducting research. And they don't understand the numbers. They don't understand what the information means. And they're not doing a good job of translating data into action. And so then it needs a little bit of a reflection and some expertise. And you may need to bring in some experts to advise you. Uh, people say research is a waste of time and money. But I found that it is just the opposite, that the amount of money and time that you put into doing research is well worth the effort and pays you back in many different ways. And I'm going to talk about some of the different ways that will pay you back. The need for research. Uh, research is basically used to enhance communication. Data is your friend. Good data are like turning on the lights. I can see now. Um, too often, health promotion experts are operating in the dark. They can't see where they're going. Uh, they know what they want to accomplish, but they're not sure uh, whether they're accomplishing it or not, or what they're doing is making any sense or not. The data will let you see where you're going and let you be strategic about moving forward. And it's difficult to get the right, to get it right the first time. Good data tells you how to refine your programs. It's not likely that your health communication program is going to be perfect the first time you design it. 
But when, once you get it out there and you get some information back, you can fine tune it so that it works better. It's different strokes for different folks. Uh, you need to design your system to work for different audiences. So segmentation of audiences is critical, but that means that you need to understand those different audiences. What are the different information and communication parameters that will be most influential with those audiences? Data gathering is the strategy that connects you to your key audiences, not only for learning more about them, but building cooperation with them. A lot of the health promotion work I, I do is based on a community participative model. And I find out that the audience analysis process of finding out and learning about my audience is also a key entree to building relationships with key representatives from different audiences. So they not only serve as cultural informants to let me know about that audience, but also become my partners in helping me to design, implement, evaluate, and later on institutionalize the best health communication programs. Data can tell you if outcomes are worth the investment, and a lot of times the people who are funding your research will want to know that. Uh, is the money that they're spending worthwhile? And I found that in a number of the studies that I've done where I've been able to demonstrate uh, that the uh, interventions are saving money, that's become the best rationale for further investment. So if you want people to invest in the work that you're doing, you want them to expand the work that you're doing, you want to build upon your early efforts, the best way of doing that is by demonstrating the viability financially of the work that you're doing. Good data can justify major investments, and so the evaluation research that you do is the best rationale you have for the value of the work that you're doing. So what is evaluation research exactly? It's a disciplined form of inquiry that involves careful, planned, and rigorous study to understand program influences and challenges to achieving program goals. It's a strategic form of gathering data in a disciplined way. Carefully planned and well-conducted evaluation research can produce valid, accurate results for guiding program development, implementation, refinement, and sustainability. So the data you gather will guide what you're doing. Evaluation research involves the use of multiple methods, although it's very typical to be using survey research and self-response data in, in, uh, in evaluation research, uh, textual analysis, the analysis of documents, the use of archival data, experimental research for evaluation, particularly field experiments, and observational research are common forms and methods for gathering evaluation data. One of the things that you need to be aware of and think about in terms of doing your research is what is the validity of your evaluation research? If you're gathering weak data, that doesn't help you at all because it doesn't give you a good picture of what's going on. So you need to design your research to promote validity. Um, internal validity is one of the most critical pieces. It concerns the accuracy of conclusions that you draw from your research study. And it means designing your study in a way that leads to accurate findings about people and programs. So you're controlling un, un, unexplained variants, uh, things that may be limiting what you're doing, and you're making sure that you're reaching people with the questions that make sense and gathering data in reliable ways. But you're also interested in external validity, which concerns the generalizability of findings from your study. Can you generalize your findings from the population that you're studying to other populations? And if you can, what are some of the limitations to that and what are some of the strengths? Because you want your research to be larger than just the area that you're conducting the research. You want to be able to generalize and promote health with a variety of different groups. And this usually involves the uh, strategic sampling, uh, replication, and designing your studies in ways that are uh, reasonable and reliable and um, accurate and call that ecological validity. Um, the first part of our research evaluation research for me that I, th that I think is so important is the um, early evaluation of the program to, in, a, in a formative way to try and make sense of what's working, what's not. Uh, these early formative data can help you refine your programs. As I mentioned earlier, it's not likely that you'll be you're able to design a program that's going to be uh, accurate and effective right off the, off the bat. 
you need to design and refine programs over time to make it stronger and tighter. And, and not only that, but the, the audiences you're working with and the societies that we're working within are constantly evolving and changing. So you need to make sure that you adapt your programs to uh, meet these changing conditions. And your formative evaluation data will tell you that. Um, the formative evaluation will assess the need for the programs and uh, needs analysis. You need to start out with what are the demands uh, what are the problems, what are the issues, and what are the concerns within the community for the health issues that you're interested in? Um, what are the key audiences that you want to reach, and what do we know about them? How can we break them down into homogenous groups so that we can provide them with similar messages and strategies that will be meaningful for them? Um, how, how much do you know about those audiences? What are their beliefs? What are their values? What are their attitudes? What are their past experiences? What are the cultural influences on their health behavior? All of those factors are going to be critical in designing messages and implementation strategies that will be meaningful and influential with them. Um, can you test the message strategies and channels that you, that you think will work? Uh, before you go large scale and spend a lot of money on these message strategies, it's a very good idea to test it out with a sample population. See how it's working, see what's, what's working and what's not working, and make sure that you can improve upon it before you spend a lot of time and energy and money on these programs. Uh, field test the implementation. Um, you know, you may have a great idea in theory, but implementing it within that culture may not be so easy. Um, what, what are the channels? What are the delivery vehicles? Who do you need cooperation from? Um, doing health promotion in the field can be very complicated, and so you need to evaluate and and test out different strategies for implementation. Uh, you want to track initial user responses to the program by gathering ongoing feedback. And one of the strategies that I, I try to utilize in almost all the programs that I develop is building in feedback mechanisms. And sometimes that can be just as simple as having a, um, an opportunity for people to provide a response. For example, if it's an online program, there might be something they'll click on that says, uh, do you have any questions? Do you have any concerns? Or it might be somebody giving calls to find out what's going on or surveying people. But it's important to get feedback from people. It may also be a formal uh, use of usability studies where you actually track people utilizing your system to see how well they're able to use it. Uh, you want to try and generate user recommendations. Uh, typically, the people who are in the communities that you want to reach have the best information about what works well with them. And so you want their feedback, you want their direction, you want them to tell you what's going to work well for them. Uh, too often, programs are designed based on the expectations of health promotion experts who are very different from the audiences that they're trying to reach. And while it may make a lot of sense to them, it doesn't really fit very well with the audience. So you've got to make sure that you have representation from those groups that you're trying to reach to let you know what's working and what's not going to work. And then you want to track responses to refine program features. So as you're making changes over time, you also are checking to make sure that those changes are working. And you're constantly in a process of refining and improving and evolving health promotion programs. So health communication, when it is effective, is not static. It's evolving, it's changing, it's being refined, and it's hopefully becoming more effective over time because of your evaluation research process. Summative evaluation is more typically what people think about when they think about evaluation research. Basically, uh, what bang are you getting from your buck? What is the effect of your research? And through summative research, you want to document program influences. Uh, for example, you want to assess the overall patterns of program use. Who's using it? How often are they using it? Um, are, how satisfied are users with your programs? Do they like it? Um, are they paying attention to it? Are they exposed to your message? Are they remembering your messages? One of the biggest problems with uh, health promotion programs is exposure, is that a lot of times we create messages that are not particularly strong. Uh, they're not repeated very often. They don't have great length. They don't have great uh, dissemination. And people don't remember them. And so if they don't hear and remember your messages, you're not likely having much effect with them. So you want to figure out what kind of exposure are your messages getting and what kind of things are people retaining. 
you also want to make sure that they're retaining what it is that you want them to retain, uh, not something else. And there's been a lot of examples of uh, systems that have not worked very well. Very well. There was the National Youth Anti-Drug Abuse Program. Oh, they used that very famous commercial of This Is Your Brain on Drugs. Do you remember that one where they had the eggs sizzling in the pan? Well, that was a, a very strong message, and exposure was high. Uh, but in terms of retention, the messages that people were getting were not exactly what people wanted, particularly for at-risk youth, high-sensation-seeking youth who are at, at risk for using drugs. They felt very challenged and, and, uh, and felt excited by that message. And not only did it not discourage them from using drugs, it actually encouraged them. They thought this was a very cool thing. And so it had a boomerang effect. And good evaluation research helped identify that problem with message retention. You want to track changes in key outcome variables. For example, what are people learning? What are, are the influences on relevant health behaviors? Um, are people using healthcare services in different ways? Uh, what kinds of health statistics are out there that are changing? One of the nice things about a lot of these outcome variables is that a lot of them are already documented uh, I mean, in archival data, uh, that people are, are maintaining health records. And if you can get access to those records and track them over time, particularly for uh, specific geographical areas, you can track what kinds of changes your programs are having with a very high degree of, uh, of, uh, of accuracy because you're not necessarily based on self-response, you're based on actual tracking data that are available often from health charts and other forms of uh, institutional records. Economic analysis of programs, cost and benefits, especially if there's some uh, economic tracking data available, uh, you can find out what are the expenditures. Are people spending more money for buying products, foods, and services that you're promoting? Um, are they utilizing them more effectively? Um, what effect is this having on um, the, uh, the retail uh, community? Um, what, through this summative evaluation, you can identify the best program strategies and features that are having the greatest effect. And then you can determine whether or not you want to sustain those programs over time and institutionalize them. Because making decisions about sustaining and institutionalizing programs should be based on good outcome evaluation data. Um, the, the other real benefit for summative evaluation is that you're building support for institutionalization. You've got good data to back up your claim that this is working, that this is important, that this needs investment. So if you need to go to uh, funders, if you need to go to uh, government agencies, if you need to go to Congress to seek funding, you've got good data to back up your claim and your request. Let me go to talk about audience analysis because it seems to me that this is really the uh, critical factor in, in, in designing most health promotion, health communication programs. Audience analysis is a prerequisite uh, to creating and refining health communications to make sure that these programs are responsive to the unique concerns, needs, and perspectives and communication styles of targeted audiences. Programs are, should be based on uh, rigorous audience analysis data um, so they are relevant, uh, so they make sure that they'll be attended to, comprehended, carefully considered, and accepted. Audience analysis activities can also establish, as I mentioned earlier, uh, connections with key audience representatives that will help you later on uh, with implementing and designing and refining your programs. So audience analysis is basically learning about your audience, and you can do that in a variety of different ways. Uh, one of the basic ways is uh, doing interviews and focus groups with uh, key members of audiences. Another way is by looking at established data, and there may be surveys, exa for example, that are available about the audiences you want to reach. But the more information you have about your audience, the more information you have about what's likely to work and how you need to design your programs. Uh, demographics uh, is it data that about the background, uh, current and past related health behaviors, communication characteristics, knowledge, attitudes, and values, cultural habits and preferences, effective motivators. These are all key pieces of audience analysis 
as well as one of the barriers to behavior change. Our audience analysis can be collected from existing data, which is uh, is a, a cost saving. It can also be collected by actually going out to your audience and conducting surveys and um, and focus groups and working with them directly. Um, key factors should be that audience analysis should guide program development. Um, audience analysis should assess program performance. Uh, uh, you, you need to gather data that are powerful and meaningful. Uh, you need to use data that will elaborate on survey findings. Um, and you need to find out what the audience characteristics are. And then you need to use those data to refine your programs. I recommend that you build evaluated research evidence into every communication program. Uh, so that you know exactly what your audience is, that you can identify natural sources of evidence that are available within your community, that you can implement built-in user response mechanisms, that you can establish baseline benchmarks for comparison later on. And as you evaluate your programs over time, those baseline measures are going to be critically important for ascertaining what difference you're making over time. Uh, that you can conduct usability tests of interventions, and you can work with audience members to design programs that meet their needs. Um, basically, you're going to be testing and refining messages and programs over time. Now, so there, there are common problems that exist with evaluation research. One is that we often will connect them at one point in time, and you don't know whether that point in time is representative. So I recommended a more longitudinal approach of gathering data at different points of time and continually gathering data, building it into everything that you're doing. Um, often there's limited validity of self-report data when used alone, and that's why I recommend a multi-methodological approach of gathering data in different ways, including the use of unobtrusive measures like archival data. Uh, sometimes the data that we gather are not very meaningful and don't tell us very much, so I like doing more in-depth in -depth analysis of user expectations and responses. Sometimes the measures are very weak. Sometimes we don't make good sense of the data and we don't report them in very good ways, uh, leading to information overload. And then there's often a failure to apply data to improving programs. So what we need is we need good data that we can utilize in very effective ways over time. We need to make sure that we're looking at representative samples and we need to make sure that we use a methodological rigor and control. So here's my, uh, my, 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 my big summary. Best practices for effective, effective program evaluation. Uh, design scalable evaluation that makes sense. Even a little good evaluation, bad, evaluation is better than no data at all. Use formative data to inform summative research. Build in feedback systems and measures into everything that you do. Identify or collect baseline data for comparisons. Conduct usability tests with representative users. Conduct in-depth, rich data audience analysis. Do not over-rely on self-report data. Collaborate with key audiences and members. If you can do all of these things, I think you'll have very good evaluation data that will guide the efforts that you use and help you be effective in health promotion. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Dr. Krebs, for that, for that presentation. For the, for the sake of time, we're going to go uh, jump right into um, Dr. Kruder's presentation. Dr. Kruder is a professor at so of social work and medicine and a member of the Institute for Public Health at Washington University in St. Louis. He is director of the Health Communication Research Laboratory, one of five NCI designated centers of excellence in cancer communication research. His research explores strategies to increase the reach and effectiveness of health information in low income and minority populations to help eliminate health disparities. Dr. Kruder received his PhD and MPH in health behavior and health education from the School of Public Health at the University of North Carolina, Chapel Hill. Dr. Kruder, the floor is yours. So uh, thank you for that introduction. I'm really excited to share with folks um, a, an online tool that we've developed for organizations that um, communicate with the public around health issues. It's called MEO, which is an acronym that stands for Make It Your Own. 
We asked this question some time ago, and uh, our center has been trying to answer it, and Mio is one of, the, one of the answers we've come up with. I think the bottom line is that we know a lot about um, how health communication can be a part of um, uh, comprehensive public health efforts to improve the health of, uh, of populations. What we have not been as successful at is getting those into widespread practice. So let's start with, with this question. So what is it that health communication does specifically that is worth uh, our investing in and spending time on? And to answer that question, one of the um, valuable resources is called the Community Guide. I suspect many people who are attending the webinar today are familiar with the Community Guide. If you're not, I think it'd be a great use of, uh, of time after the webinar to take a look at it. The Community Guide uh, conducts uh, systematic evidence-based reviews of uh, interventions and approaches that have been demonstrated to be effective um, by uh, public health science. And if you look through the community guide, you'll find that there's actually quite a lot of health communication in there. I'm not going to read these to you, but you can see some of the strategies that have been shown to be a part of, um, of effective solutions to public health problems. Um, those problems include the ones that you're looking at now. Um, so quite a range from uh, chronic disease to uh, 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 communicable diseases and, and other health outcomes. Notably missing from the list would be environmental health uh, uh, information and, um, and exposure risk communication. I don't think that means that there is no evidence for health communications benefits there. I think it just hasn't yet been subjected to a systematic review, but certainly If you look at um, public agencies like NIEHS, you will see uh, a host of information that's uh, designed for uh, kind of public audiences, public facing information. For example, these fact sheets on asthma and lead exposure. Information designed for different audiences like children and even within the audience of children subgroups uh, based on um, language, as you see the two versions of this um, particular product. Um, and uh, subgroups divided not just by demographic characteristics, but by other characteristics such as um, occupational exposures that you see here. So, um, so lots of information being used in various forms. If we go back to what the community guide um, tells us, uh, we have strong evidence to, um, to support. What exactly, are these, um, what exactly are these interventions? Well, as Gary said, um, historically they've been print-based. So you see things like posters or reminder postcards that are sent in the mail or um, pamphlets and brochures. But increasingly, they're becoming uh, much more uh, technologically advanced, and so they come in the form of, uh, of text messages or um, websites or emails. The, the point is that we um, have both a growing, we both have an established evidence base for some traditional uh, media and a growing evidence base for some of, uh, some of our new media. So who uses resources like these that are um, evidence-based communication strategies? Well, a lot of different organizations, organizations um, that are represented by listeners on today's webinar. We wanted to know what some of these organizations uh, thought about the health communication resources that they currently had and use. And so uh, a couple of summers ago, two summers ago, we surveyed um, a sample of uh, public health departments at the state local level, primary care providers, and also community-based organizations, especially in um, uh, focusing on tribal populations. 
And we asked them a number of questions, and I just wanted to highlight a couple of those for you. First of all, we asked them how satisfied they were with the quality and the number of the health communication resources that they had. And this question was specific to colorectal cancer, resources to promote colorectal cancer screening. And you can see that they weren't particularly satisfied with either. So they didn't think that what they had was very good, and they didn't feel like they had um, enough of it. Furthermore, they expressed particular needs for uh, information resources that were targeted to particular populations, um, especially rural populations, men, and Hispanics. And they also needed information that was in languages other than English, most commonly Spanish. So if you just summarize uh, across the findings from the survey, and I know I've just uh, uh, scratched the surface there, but what these organizational representatives were telling us was that their work, their communication work, involved reaching diverse populations. Their organizations often had limited technical skills in the area of health communication and almost universally had limited budgets uh, to work with. And I think Gary alluded to that before. Let me say a little bit about diverse populations to start with. So how does the field of communication handle the challenge of reaching the diverse audiences? Well, Traditionally, what we've done is uh, what Gary referred to as audience segmentation and targeting. So even with a common message, we will um, uh, package it and deliver it, package it in different ways uh, to appeal to audiences and deliver it in different places that would reach those audiences. This is a, a, a conventional but very effective approach. Increasingly, new technologies are giving us better tools. So. Um, there's a, a process called co-creation. You might not know the term, but almost certainly you know the process. So I want to illustrate it with a couple of commercial products here. If you went to the L.L. Bean website, you could make your own tote bag. You just make a couple of choices. So how big a bag do you want and what color do you want it to be? What color is the bag? What color are the straps? Does it have a... Uh, a zipper, does it have a pocket? You make the choices and then you can order your LL Bean tote bag. Or maybe some of you have made your own shoes at the Nike ID website where you choose the shoe that you wanna make, you choose the fabric and the material that it's gonna be made and then you start choosing all the customizations that you'd like, what color are the laces or the swoosh or the tongue or the midsole and the outsole. You pay a little premium but you get your own custom Nike shoes. So we wondered what it would look like if we could provide the same sort of online resource um, to the public health community to create effective health communication resources, not shoes or tote bags. And how could we do that for users that would have limited technical skills and limited budgets? And so our answer to that has been Mio, and I want to give you a quick demo and tell you a little bit about it, and then, um, and then we'll wrap up. Mio is based on what we call our Mio Creed, which are, are, uh, is pretty simple, these three points, that we think that every, organiz every community that's served by some organization is unique in its own ways. We have a very strong evidence base in health communication science that customization matters. This is why you do the audience research that Gary talked about. And that we think the people who are best suited to customize information for specific populations are the local insiders and experts who work with those populations themselves. So Mio tries to do all of those things. When you log on to Mio, you enter your username and a password on the screen that you see here. And the first thing you do is indicate whether you're going to create some new health communication resources or if you're going to go back and revise things that you made on a previous visit. Let's say you're creating a new resource. The first thing you do 
is choose from the kinds of evidence-based interventions that are available within the system. So the demo I'm showing you is for colorectal cancer, promoting colorectal cancer screening. I'm just going to blow this up for you here. You see that on this drop-down menu, these are all um, uh, community guide recommended evidence-based strategies for promoting colorectal cancer screening. So you're going to choose which of these types of resources you want to make. Let's say that you're going to choose a, 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 a poster, um, whether that's electronic or print. So you're going to look at all the different versions of posters that you could make and select one, and perhaps you select um, poster D here. And then you begin customizing it. And you first customize it with images. So you're going to choose from a, a, a really significant library of images that is uh, tagged by many different uh, subcategories. So you can search by um, racial or ethnic groups or other population characteristics. You're going to select an image, um, and then you're going to select a message and taglines and click create, and it's going to create for you uh, this digital document that you can use in, in many different ways, online or otherwise. Um, you can create lots of different things with uh, Mio. This is um, the menu of options for the colorectal cancer screening um, uh, module that I have just shown you. Within that module, there are actually 24 different versions of six evidence-based interventions you can create with hundreds of messages and images um, to choose from. We have, since the launch of MEO two years ago, we have over 500 registered users from nearly 400 organizations in all but uh, two states. And collectively, they have um, created and rendered, actually they've created far more than this, but they've actually rendered into usable communication documents over 5,000 different NEO creations. Now, the distribution of that, of course, we hope would be much greater. That's actually just individual communication documents that have been created. I'll show you a couple just to illustrate the diversity of it. These were um, two versions of the same communication made um, in New Mexico. You can see the, the focus on different populations that they selected. Again, here are two uh, colorectal cancer uh, 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 reminder postcards uh, from Iowa. Here, um, here's another uh, communication piece where you actually see how, how four organizations in four different states took the same basic template and used it to target different audiences in different languages with different images. So you get a sense for the ability to uh, localize these. Let me close by telling you a little bit about what we know about um, uh, NEO's effects. The first MEO we created was kind of a low-tech version to promote HPV vaccination among African American uh, and Hispanic young women um, and, and girls. And uh, they could create a, a, a range of documents by selecting images and messages. And these are some of the things that they created. And in a quasi-experimental study where St. Louis and the lower Rio Grande Valley uh, area on the Texas-Mexico border had access to this and two control communities in the same states did not, We found that um, uh, in the year following the launch of MIA, we were able to significantly increase calls to the 1-800-FOR-CANCER information line um, about, this, uh, about this subject by virtue of making this, uh, these MIA resources available to organizations to distribute to their clients. The second 
a little story I'll tell you is about a Mio product focused on uh, promoting use of tobacco quit lines. These are some of the materials that uh, people could make and some of the images that they had access to choosing. And we wanted to make these available to um, food stamps participants through the food stamps offices in Missouri because we had done some audience research and found that smoking rates were very high, about 40% among food stamps participants. So we launched this uh, two Septembers ago, and in the first week, this is how many food stamps offices in Missouri had um, uh, used the system to create their own uh, quitline referrals. This is week two. Week three. Week four. And in five weeks, we had every single food stamps office in the state of Missouri, all 117 of them, who had created their own customized quitline referrals and were distributing them to their clients who smoke. We surveyed them a couple of months later, and um, their responses were reassuring. So one of the things we wanted to know is how confident they were that they, they knew what their clients uh, would pay attention to. And you can see that over 90% of them agreed or strongly agreed that they have a good sense of what their clients would, uh, would attend to. So in fact, they are the right people to be designing these resources. We also asked them why they chose to order these materials, and we were, uh, we were interested that over two-thirds of them identified as their, one of their top three reasons that they were able to customize these for their populations by choosing their own photos and, um, and messages. And uh, best of all, there was some staying power here. We went back to every food stamps office in a statewide uh, tour last summer, and 98%, um, all but two, basically, of those food stamps office, offices were still using and distributing quit, lines, uh, quit line referrals. Many of them had uh, ordered more from us. So just to summarize, I think the value of this approach is that it, is, it draws on um, an evidence base from the community guide. It allows organizations to customize for their particular populations, gives them the ability to create very high quality communication resources, even if they don't have that expertise in-house. We've got very good uh, uh, user data about uh, people's ease of use. Um, and uh, a growing body of proven results. So we hope that this is a tool that will expand soon to uh, environmental health information and uh, exposure risk communication. In the meantime, we encourage you to uh, register and try it out. Uh, pass it along to your colleagues who might be doing work um, that, uh, that Mio could help you with, and we're very open to comments and suggestions. So thank you very much for listening. Thank you very much, Matt. At this time, we will go ahead and um, move on to our third presenter today. I'd like to introduce uh, Dr. Brian Zygmunt Fisher. He is an assistant professor at the Department of Health, Behavior, and Health Education at the University of Michigan School of Public Health, a research assistant professor at UM's Department of Internal Medicine and a member of both the UM Center of Bioethics and Social Sciences in Medicine and the UM Risk Science Center. He received his PhD in Behavioral Decision Theory uh, from Carnegie Mellon University. He uses his interdisciplinary background to study factors that affect individual decision-making about a variety of health and medical issues with a particular emphasis on risk communication and numeracy. Dr. Zygmunt Fischer's research projects have included co-directing the National Survey of Medical Decisions, leading an NIEHS-funded grant studying perceptions of risk from dioxin exposure within an affected community, and directing the American Cancer Society Award regarding the development and testing of visual displays to help patients visualize their risks. Dr. Zygmunt Fischer, 
The floor is yours. Thank you very much, Liam. I'm glad to be here and glad to be able to talk with our audience today about trying to make the data communications that we often provide as part of public health more intuitively meaningful and understandable to our users. But to ground this, I'd like to start our discussion by introducing you to Joseph. Uh, this is a hypothetical person, but one drawn from real experience. Uh, this is a person who, so let's say, is a middle-aged guy. He lives in Midland, Michigan, which happens to be an area in which there is known dioxin exposure. And he was a participant in the University of Michigan dioxin exposure study. As part of this study, he had his blood tested for dioxins, as well as his household dust and soil tested. And after he was participating in this study, he received a results letter that told him this. The, the level of total dioxin TEQ in the blood sample you provided based on these 21 congeners is 33.1 picograms per gram of blood lipid. Joseph goes off, he goes back out to his friends. Let's say he's inviting some people over for a barbecue and he says, yeah, what'd you do today? And they say, well, you know, I got this letter. I was part of this study of dioxins and they took my blood and they tested it and they gave me my results, but I'm still confused. I don't know whether I'm at risk or not. And I think Joseph's tale underlines sort of the point, right? Is Joseph informed about his dioxin exposure? Well, clearly the answer to that has to be yes. We have given him a quantitative estimate of the exact amount of dioxin in his blood and in his environment. But is he informed in a meaningful way about his dioxin-related risk? I have to say I think the answer is no, because he doesn't know what to do with that information. So there's a series of problems here, and I'm going to go through them one by one to sort of identify what the barriers are to making these types of exposure, exposure communications more useful to the end users. One problem is numeracy. Now, we've talked a lot in public health about the need to ensure that our communications and our materials are written in ways that have used plain language that are understandable to our target audiences. But the same can be true when we think about providing quantitative information. Now, there are a number of definitions of numeracy that are out there in the literature. Um, I happen to like this one. I define numeracy as the ability to understand, transform, and derive meaning from quantitative health information. And to make this concrete for you, let me show you a sample question that's used in one of the standard numeracy measures. Which of the following numbers represents the biggest risk of getting a disease? One in 100, one in 1,000, or one in 10? Now, I hope all of you who are listening today recognize that the answer here is one in 10. But it may disturb you to know that in a college-educated U.S. sample, one in five, or about 25% of people, get this wrong. And in fact, that number goes up when you consider people who are older, because numeracy is related to age, and who have lower education. Although, don't make the mistake of assuming that numeracy is purely something that's linked to education. While there is a correlation between numeracy skills and education, the correlation is remarkably small from my perspective. And in fact, there are many highly educated people who are just not that comfortable with numbers. Does numeracy matter? I think it does, and I'll show you a variety of ways in which we've found links between measurable numeracy skills and people's ability to manage health data. So we have information that shows that people's ability to read graphics or find relevant information in larger sets, like reference tables, is highly linked to numeracy. It's also linked to more practical functional skills, like being able to adjust medication dosing based upon, let's say, a child's weight, or interpret a nutrition label, or execute diabetes management tasks. 
These are all things that we want people to be able to do in everyday life that are linked to their ability to manage numbers. So one problem may be Joseph may just not have that money, numerous, that good of a numeracy skills, and that could inhibit his ability to make sense of the exposure information we provided. But I doubt that's the only problem, because fundamentally, we didn't meet Joseph's information needs. What do we want Joseph to know about his risks? Well, what Joseph wanted was to know whether he was safe, to know whether he was in danger. Now, not in an absolute sense, but at least in a relative sense. What he got was a number that described his exposure, but did not in fact have that meaning, what he was looking for. And the concept here is something that I would call, and the literature has called in the psychological and decision-making literature, information evaluability. And put simply, this is just simply the difference between what a number is and what a number means to the person who's receiving it. And the key point from a series of research studies that have been published over the last 15 years is that the meaning of a number changes depending upon whether you evaluate it, you try to make sense of it by itself or in comparison with other statistics. Let me give you an example by going back to Joseph's dioxin level. Joseph learned in his letter that his blood level was over 33. And the units here is not really the point. But you can think about what is he going to compare that against? And I'll give you a couple different reference frames that he might use to compare his number versus something else. One frame is he might have been told that the level of dioxin compounds in his blood was at the 95th percentile among people in his age group. Now, assuming he has the numeracy skills to understand what 95th percentile means, something I'm not sure we can assume, he's going to look at that and go, okay, 95th percentile, that's much higher than average. I'm in trouble. He's going to be afraid. A different frame might be, say, a historical frame. Right? We could also provide him with information about historical levels of dioxin. And in this case, we might tell him, for example, that the estimated mean level of dioxins in people's blood in national samples back in 1970 was 90. Now, if he sees that reference standards, 90, of course, is much larger than 33. He's probably going to be relatively relieved. So here's the challenge. Both of these frames could be true simultaneously. So the meaning that Joseph is going to take away from his number is going to depend upon whether we give him one, the other, both, or neither. And that question then goes back to us as communicators. What meaning do we want him to take away? Because really, ultimately, it's not clear that Joseph needs a number. What Joseph wants is what I've called in a recent paper categorical possibility knowledge. He wants, he wants to know which group of people he falls into in terms of his risk. That's what will help him decide whether or not he needs to do something about his exposure or not. Hence, he really needs meaning more than he needs numbers. Speaking of which, we only gave him a number, right? We gave him a single number. We didn't even go beyond a numerical format to give him perhaps a visual. And I want to introduce a concept here, which is basically the idea of reference anchors. That whenever we give somebody quantitative information about themselves or about their environment, ideally we would like to help them visualize where that number falls in the range of relevant possibilities. Now I've just included on this slide a very simplistic line graph with markers for that 90 part, and let's say for 15 as as what we, we might guess would be the median number at the time his reference sample was taken. Now, he can see here that his number is clearly larger than the 
reference standard at the moment, but it's clearly lower, substantially lower, than the historical reference. We can argue about which reference standards are the appropriate ones, but I look at this and I see a much more easy to interpret reference of the meaning of that 33 than I would ever get by just providing me with a number. And I'm going to step out of the environmental domain for a moment because a lot of work in terms of visual displays has been done not in the context of environmental risk communication, but in terms of medical risk communication. So let's take, for example, the online risk calculators that are often available. This is an example uh, of one that might be used to, to calculate a woman's risk of developing breast cancer, but there are plenty others out there about your risk of cardiovascular disease or diabetes or whatever. You know, these calculators use, you in, input various information, here, for example, your age, your race, and some other information that we know based upon predictive models affects your future risk of developing cancer. And based on those set of traits, we get back a personalized risk of getting cancer. Now, as uh, the previous speakers have talked about, personalization of information is a very powerful um, way to get people interested in our messages. And so we've at least done that here. We've given you our personal risk of getting breast cancer. But that 10.3% here is a little bit hard for many people to interpret, especially if they don't have good numeracy skills. Now, there's probably 10 or 15 years worth of work that's been done, and, and I've been part of it, but others have as well, into a visual display that really does seem to help people understand risk. And that is this, an icon array display. What you see here is a 10 by 10 matrix that represents the full population of women. The colored blocks represents those who would be diagnosed with breast cancer, while the gray blocks represents those who would not. We see the part-whole relationships so that you get a sense of, in fact, most women are not going to develop breast cancer. At the same time, we can count each individual woman out of that hundred who would in fact develop cancer. Now, many of you might be saying, yes, this is great, Brian. I'm, I'm glad you showed me this. But if I can't do this in Microsoft Excel or something like that, I'm never going to be able to use this. And I appreciate that problem, which is why I and some colleagues here at the University of Michigan have been developing this. IconArray.com. This is a free, online, customizable, and tailorable Icon Array Risk Graphics Generator. Um, we are in the process of developing its functionality right now, but I encourage people who are interested in communicating risk statistics to take a look at the site and potentially use it for developing of health risk communication materials. But I think it's also worth pausing and asking, do we even need to be giving a number at all? Right? There are many types of risk communications in the, the non-health world that are done through visual displays that aren't giving us the underlying numbers. If I go to choose mutual funds at something like Schwab, or if I go to pick consumer products at something like Consumer Reports, we tend to get not big tables of numbers, but graphics like these that enable us to show the trade-off between risk and other attributes, whether they be return or function or cost, etc. These types of graphics can help us see the relevant trade-offs but are much more understandable to the general public. So we always have to ask ourselves, why are we giving somebody a number? And might it be possible to get the gist message across in other ways? My point here is that we need to match data type and format with recipients' immediate and specific needs. It's not good enough to say, this data exists and somebody might want it. We have to think about designing communications to meet specific needs at, at a specific point in time. So what might be important for one person to get in a tabular format, another person, or maybe even the same person at a different point in time, might need a graphic with a different set of reference points so that they can make sense of it. But even if we do all of those things, I think it's worth acknowledging the fact 
that accurate communication of data does not always solve the problems that we want our communications to address. Because even if we tell people in a meaningful way how much they have been exposed, that doesn't necessarily give them the conceptual knowledge they need to make good decisions. Think about this. When, communi when communities have exposure to contaminants of, of whatever type, the exposure studies that identify that contamination generally focus on where the contaminant is and the level of the contamination. But those facts by themselves do not necessarily enable residents to make sense of what it means to live in this environment and to manage their risk. And the way to do that may be to support development of mental models of risk. Now, this mental model approach is one that came out of some people I trained with at Carnegie Mellon, Carnegie Mellon, which is a systematic method for assessing and comparing experts' mental models of exposure and risk versus lay models. The idea is to, instead of trying to bombard people with tons of information, to very narrowly and specifically identify gaps in lay knowledge or misconceptions in their knowledge as targets for future communications. I had, as uh, Liam mentioned, I've had the fortune to be working with Edith Parker, who's now at the University of Iowa, as well as Al Fransblau here at the University of Michigan, in a community perceptions of dioxins study, in which we went back to the Midland and Saginaw areas of Michigan, and areas which has known historical dioxin exposure, and applied this model to understanding community residents' understandings of both what dioxins are and dioxin-related exposure risk. Now, this complicated model that I'm showing you now is our, our boiled-down version of the expert model of dioxin. And I'll just sort of walk you through it linearly. Up at the top, we have different sources, including chemical manufacture, which is what was the primary source in Midland, as well as combustion and other types of industrial uses. That then moves into the environment through air or water emissions and could be resident in oil, in air, in soil, in river sediment, etc., and work its way as we move down through the food chain or being inhaled and eventually getting into people's bodies, which then might have an impact downstream on health. What we found was when we interviewed community residents, many concepts shown here by the green circles, people seem to have pretty good understanding of. And I'll give you a specific example. In our large community-based survey, we ask people, can people get dioxins in their bodies by eating food or by eating game animals that live on contaminated land? And as you see here, the vast majority of residents believe those things were true. They anticipated that that was a relevant exposure pathway. However, we also found some key incongruent beliefs, some misconceptions. And I flagged over here on the right water concentration. And here's why. You see, the residents in this community were initially told that dioxins were, that the industrial discharge had been dumped into the river. And so dioxins were found in the river. The problem is that dioxins, chemically, are hydrophobic and lipophilic. They avoid water and they have almost no solubility in water. They dissolve in oil. When we asked people questions specifically about beliefs of dioxins in water, many, many residents believed that dioxins could be found in well water, groundwater supplies, or could be found in river water that had been filtered to remove all soil and sediment. These, water, these types of water bodies in the environment do not have water, I mean, do not have dioxins in them, because dioxins are not soluble in water but many, many residents believe that they are. And we found a direct correlation 
between the number of beliefs that somebody had about dioxins being dissolvable in water and resident in water supplies and the belief that drinking water or even touching water in the environment was a significant source of dioxin exposure in this community. So this isn't just abstract facts. These facts in people's mental models are leading them to believe certain things to be sources of exposure and other things to be not sources of exposure because of their relationship to this chemical property. This suggests that perhaps one of the approaches we need to think about when we communicate about environmental contaminants is not just to talk about where it is and how much of it it is, but also to provide analogies to help clarify contaminants and chemical properties. In many ways, dioxins are like oil. And the more that we can get people to think about them that way, the more they may be able to anticipate that it's not the water they need to worry about, but it's the soil and the sediment. My summary here is that I think there's a variety of implications for communication practice when we're trying to communicate about risk and quantitative data. First, it's not just good enough to provide a person with their number. We have to provide context and potentially use appropriate visuals to make that data meaningful because a number by itself is not necessarily going to meet the needs of our audiences. And secondly, I want to reinforce the idea that we need to think hard about what are the key properties of the contaminants or of the threats that exist within the environment and enable people to have evidence-based mental models of those things so that they can make their own decisions about what is safe or potentially what is dangerous and to manage their risk appropriately. And so I think I'll leave it there and uh, throw it back to Liam for questions. Well, thank you very much, Brian, for your uh, nice presentation. At this time, what I'd like to do is I'd like to open the floor for questions and answers. Um, so we've got a couple here, one for each one of the panelists. And uh, Dr. Krebs, we'll start with you. The uh, first uh, question that we have is, how do you ensure that the feedback that you receive represents the target or intended audience? That is, does the feedback um, come from only the high levels of uh, those with the high levels of health literacy? Yeah, there's a couple different ways of gathering feedback. One is uh, an intentional method of trying to um, uh, target people that you want to get feedback from. Uh, that way you can make sure that you're getting information from uh, those people who you're most interested in hearing from. And then there's a, a kind of a uh, unselected open way of just generally gathering feedback. Um, in those cases, what you'd like to do is see if you can identify some basic characteristics of the people who are providing um, uh, open feedback yeah. to make sure that they represent different groups. Excellent. Thank you. Matt, the question that I have for you is, does Neo do websites? Uh, great question. We're actually in the process of rebuilding what is going to be version 3.0 of the Mio platform, and it does create documents for, it doesn't create, um, you know, sort of like web skins, if you will, sort of your know, designs for sites, but it includes pieces that can be imported uh, directly to websites. So I would say that's kind of a um, gets you gets you closer, if not all the way there. Excellent. Now we um, we got a couple of quick follow-on questions to that, asking about um, is there a fee or is there a cost associated with uh, Mio? So I knew the instant that Brian uh, pointed out that his the site he's building is free, that I should have said the same thing. Uh, Mio is also free for users. All right, excellent. Thank you for that clarification. So Brian, the, the question that I have for you, um, the graph approach is nice. I question if it would be better to use quote unquote average for both instead of using quote-unquote median for CDC result and quote-unquote average for the 1970s results? So this question raises in some sense a much larger point that I skipped over in the interest of speed, which is 
what is the most appropriate and useful reference standard to provide? Um, often in these kinds of contexts, we may have limited information about what the appropriate reference standards might be. In the context of dioxins I'm just, that I happen to be familiar with, for example, there were available reference standards for anchoring um, blood levels based upon prior national surveys, but there were no available reference standards before the U University of Michigan study regarding things like dust, household dust levels. They simply didn't exist. Um, and whether you would use an average or a median would in, pen, in part depend upon what the characteristics of the data are, right? Um, I think most people understand what an average is better than what a median is. On the other hand, if you've got highly skewed data, it may be actually more useful to try and communicate the median as a better reference point for somebody's just feeling of whether or not their value is, and I'm going to put quotes around this, normal or something that they need to be worried about. And that's going to have to be determined in each application based upon what the audience's needs are and what the available data are. All right. Uh, thank you. So um, a question actually for all three of you. Um, in general, there is much less known regarding health risks associated with environmental chemical exposure versus other risk factors, that is diet, age, etc. And when quantitative risk estimates are available, they tend to be smaller. Do you suggest comparing across environmental chemicals versus other risk factors for a disease? And when is it appropriate or not appropriate? I can try and take a swing at this. I think for me, this is a question of what the goal of the communication is. There are certainly situations in which we want people to be focusing on the relative degree of risk from different causes and different risk factors. And it may be appropriate to be comparing um, you know, the impact of diet on risk versus an environmental exposure to show, hey, you know what? Diet is a really big comparative size and hence we should put our attention there. At the same time, there are other situations in which we want people to pay attention and potentially take action about risk, even if something is comparatively low, because let's say it's something that can be acted upon relatively easily or it has important downstream implications. In those kinds of contexts, perhaps we would want to change what other kinds of contextual information we would provide to make sure that people saw those low numbers as nonetheless something important for us to act upon. So this is Matt. I, I will, uh, I'll attempt to weigh in there as well. I think part of the confusion that, um, that members of the public feel in trying to understand uh, the magnitude of various risks is that it, it, in a way we, in, as the you know, health and medical scientific community, we, we compete with ourselves by promoting each new finding as if it was perhaps more certain than it really is. And absent the context of all the other risks that one might um, encounter or exposures they might um, encounter. And so I do think there's a, there's a, a responsibility public health wide to try to put some of these exposures and risks into a broader context. And, and I would just second wholeheartedly what Brian described as sort of the mental model approach. I think it's not realistic to expect that most people will be able to understand and process the um, sort of the, the, the particulars of uh, probability and risk, but it is a reasonable goal to try to get them to understand things that are more important uh, to them and their family and things that are relatively less important. Excellent. So I have another question for all three panelists. Um, what are your recommendations for communicating uncertainty? Certainly a big issue in terms of environmental health exposures and what it means for health outcomes. I'll take a shot at that. You know, it seems to me that the goal of the health communicator is to reduce uncertainty. And so what you want to do is to try and provide some context 
and relevance to the issues that you're communicating and provide people with relevant information for reducing uh, equivocality and helping them make good choices. So, uh, you know, the goal is to um, take things that are uncertain and unclear and make them as clear as possible. If I can just add on to um, that comment, I think one thing that public health communicators don't always do as well as we wish we would is to be clear of what is known even as we have to describe what is not known. Um, one of the truths of, of risk communication is that usually the audience thinks that the magnitude of uncertainty that is being described is way larger than what the experts think the magnitude of uncertainty is. Um, if we're talking about the potential health risks of a particular type of exposure and, and there's a scientific debate about it, that scientific debate is not about, is not usually completely unbounded. It's usually actually quite specific in terms of the relative rates of uh, different health outcomes occurring in different populations. Whereas in, in many contexts, I think an uninformed population is just imagining anything. And that the more that we can say, well, we're not exactly sure about how much exposure might matter or about what the health effects might be. But what we are sure of is that it's not causing widespread birth defects and we're white, we are sure that it's not causing X, Y, and Z. That clarification of what is known will help people make sense of the uncertainty of what is not yet known. I'll, I'll add one uh, slightly, um, um, I'll add a comment in a slightly different direction. This one aimed at the scientific community. I think part of the problem um, and we're going to have to continue to wrestle with this, is that the scientists, as scientists, we are trained to recognize um, every possible you know, alternative explanation and um, contingency um, reasons why this is not you know, the definitive study, and science is rarely definitive, that, that we have a kind of aversion to... Um, to absolutes or to saying, look, this is, you know, this is something to be avoided. We're not quite sure yet. And I think our own um, unwillingness to, uh, to do that at gets passed along to the public and other stakeholders in ways that aren't always productive. So I think we're going to have to find a, do a better job of finding kind of a happy median between when is there enough enough science for us to say with some authority that these are things to be avoided, even if we can't be particularly precise about, um, about exposure doses. And I know that's vague, and I'm hardly an expert in this area, but in the areas that I've worked in cancer, um, we experience the same sorts of struggles. So I would say that's an area where the scientific community can make some progress. And I'll just add one last piece to this, which is going back to what I said in my presentation. In many situations, what the audience wants is to be able to categorize themselves. And so if we're talking about a situation in which the uncertainty is sufficiently narrow that we can accurately categorize you, even if we don't ex know exactly what, where you would fall within that category, then we may not even need to get into that the level of detail where the uncertainty exists. We can just simply say, look, you're at above average risk. You know, go do something about this. So I have two more questions here. Um, one is for Matt and the other one is for Brian. So one starting with Matt, um, for the MEO site, uh, do you have the research literature that supports the educational materials? The short answer is that the system is intentionally built upon an existing um, uh, evidence-based recommendations from the community guide. Now, does that mean that every product generated or created through the MIO system will be effective? Um, no, it doesn't. Uh, it could be poorly imp implemented. It could, selections could be made that are perhaps suboptimal, even though the user believes they're making the right choice. So um, we do what we would call uh, audience testing of the component parts, the images and the messages with um, the 
organizational users. But um, I also, I, I guess that what I want to um, suggest is that um, we're going to have to find a way to get proven approaches into more widespread practice in ways that don't require every single user to start from scratch um, and, and, and create from the ground up their own resources and campaigns. If that's, if that's the process we rely upon, I think we're going to, um, I think we're going to be disappointed with both what we can generate and what the results are for the reasons that I pointed out in my, in my talk. So I think um, I would encourage people to think about Mio as a kind of translational tool for evidence-based health communication um, that, uh, that, that attempts to apply the best information we have, the best communication practices, and give the control of that to local organizations. All right. And to close out today's session, the final question is for Brian. You've given examples of exposure or risk in human scale. Could you comment on how important it is to express health communication in human scale? In human scale, I think this is challenging because human scale means different things at, for different purposes, right? There are times when we want to be communicating at the scale that is meaningful to the individual where, and, and what's hard about risk communication in general is that you know, we don't experience risk per se. What we experience is outcomes. Something bad happens or it doesn't happen, but we're never sort of 70% bad. And trying to put that kind of uncertainty into meaningful, uh, into, into meaning for an individual is basically asking them to imagine their life moving forward and how likely or unlikely something is to happen. But there's a very different problem when we talk about the human scale of exposure at the community level, right? To really ground into, into concrete terms, okay, this level of exposure or this level of cancer burden means that, that this population is going to be affected in these you know, so many people are going to be affected, so many people are going to have their lives changed, et cetera, or so many people are going to have exposure levels of a certain, um, meeting a certain threshold. I think concreteness becomes the importance when we start thinking about quantitative data communications at that kind of community or population level. Saying 10%, particularly for less numerate people, feels small. Saying 10 out of every 100 people are going to have something happen to them, feels quite different. All right. Well, at this time, I'd like to uh, thank all three of our panelists today for their excellent presentations. A lot of the comments coming in to the question area were um, notes of appreciation. So thank you all very much. And thanks to all our participants for joining us today in the uh, PEPH webinar on communication research. Um, as we close, just a couple of quick announcements. Please keep in touch with us with PEPH, and you can join our listserv um, today by emailing PEPH at NIEHS.NIH.gov. It should be up on the screen. And we have some upcoming webinars, and you can stay abreast of those by uh, checking out our Partnerships for Environmental Public Health webpage um, that, that is available to everybody. So thanks once again to our presenters, Dr. Gary Kreps, Matthew Kruder, and Brian Zickman-Fisher. Thank you all, and have a great day. Have a safe Memorial Day weekend.